<laughs> Attention Earthlings, do not attempt to adjust your dial. You are about to voyage into the marvelously mystifying. Join us as we navigate the enigmatic waters of consciousness, delve into the arcane realms of the occult and the paranormal, and converse with captivating beings from across the universe. Prepare to expand your mind, challenge your perceptions, and journey into the unknown with your guides, Benicula and HP Hovercraft. The frequencies of strangeness await. Welcome, Welcome to, to Dizzy Spell. Dizzy Spell. Dizzy Spell. Do you think it'd be funny if I did the same riff <laughs> where I was like, I've been thinking about my names. <laughs> no, I'm not going to do it. That'd be really funny if you didn't listen to the last, if you'd listen to these out of order in any sort of way, but that's not how you are doing it. Listener. That's right. You know, exactly. You're in on every <laughs> joke. You have to listen to everybody. Every episode is canon. You know about little alien freak. Yes. I barely know about <laughs> little alien freak. You know about saucerritis. You know about, hey, my my house heard your name earlier. Yeah. Recent, recent one. Yeah. Uh, running bits. That We should do a, <laughs> in the future, mm-hmm. a tier not maybe not a tier list, but like a bracket mm. of dizzy spell bits. <laughs> I like it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then people can vote <laughs> on them, and it's like, what's the ultimate bit? I like it. Hey, so we haven't even really talked about it off air much lately, but I have been working on some dizzy spell merch. Cool. Would it be crazy if we had a sticker that just said, "Hey, my house said your name earlier." <laughs> hey, my my other house said your name earlier. <laughs> My other house. Going like, I like the idea of <laughs> like getting so abstract with yeah. like the common <laughs> car bumper sticker. Yeah. Like my other, that my other car is a blank blank. Yes. What would we do? I don't know. My, my other house said your name earlier. <laughs> it's my pitch. I like it. For it. <laughs> Good stuff. All right. Welcome to Dizzy Spell, listeners. I am Benicula. I almost said I'm HP Hovercraft again. I'm Benicula. <laughs> I'm HP Hovercraft. <laughs> How do I do that every time? Uh, didn't you have some some more movies and stuff you wanted to talk about at the top of yes. this episode? Yes. Okay. Okay. Have you watched Ren Fair? No, but I've heard HBO. it's awesome. I gotta watch Ooh, it. Oh man, yeah. it's good. It's 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 really good. It's, I've heard it's awesome. It's quite a bit different than I expected yeah. it to be in that, like, it's more our, like, the, I think that it takes a little bit of artistic liberty with the story. story. Uh-huh. Like, it's almost somewhere between, like, a docuseries and, like, a dramatization of the thing. Okay. Um, and I didn't really expect that going in. And it's not, you don't learn that much about, like... Renfair culture necessarily. Oh, interesting. Okay. Like it's way more like a topical thing about it's way, way more of a character study of like four specific people. Okay. I've kind of heard that. Yeah, that makes um, sense. But it does rock. Okay. I've like, heard it's great. Like I really want to go to that me specific too. Renfair. It's like I don't know. Busy road trip, man. That'd Dude, be so fun. It's like it's like that's a I have to go. Yeah. I have to go. Okay. We should. We should. It's, we'll take your kid. We'll take the whole family. It'll be awesome. And it's awesome because it's like 20 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> like it's not like Yeah. I bet they're going to capitalize on this though. They for do. Sure. Well, they But it's d- open like longer than our rent fair, right? Yeah. It's not just a month. Yeah. But it is it's seasonal. Like all summer. Yeah. Um, That's and way it's, cooler though. And it is like... I feel like the people that were... Like our rent fair is pretty good. Mm-hmm. But it's like the people that... I'm. I don't, I don't know this like for a fact. I'm fairly certain. If you know, if you're a Ren, if you work at the Ren Fair, mm-hmm. please oh. email us or, or God, please email. I us. would love to interview. That's a. That's actually. I don't have a lot of people that I'd like to interview. I would love to interview somebody. My old DM at the actually Ren Fair. My old DM what ran the I think Axe Ring booth for a long time. No way. Yes. And yeah. has some stories for sure. We could probably uh, make that happen. That's really funny. Yeah. Yeah. I would. It I just want to know. I just want to know what the deal is. Um, but. I'm pr- I'm fairly certain that like the people that run those ones or at least are like the performers and things like travel. Yes. And like are at 
Multi, yes. Like they like I'm at the Tennessee Ren Fair this month, and then mm-hmm. that's like all during like Ren Fair season. But like the uh, the one into the Texas Renaissance Festival, those people that's what they do, mm-hmm. and they make their money during that time, wow. and then the rest of the time they chill, do, do something, stuff? yeah, plan for it, huh. think about it, yeah. Um, oh man! But yeah, basically, so cool. it's like the the guy that founded it and did it for. Had and still is doing it, mm-hmm. did it for 50 plus years. That's like his life's work. Mm-hmm. He based all of it around like doing things like the, uh, like, like they did things in. You're talking about a time period? Yeah. Mm. Um, but it's all like craftsmen building everything, doing everything from scratch. In the st- in, like way it was done yes, at the time. And they just like, keep adding and adding and adding mm. to it. And eventually like he incorporated it as his own city. So he can do whatever wow. he wanted. They get like 30,000 people and sees like. Wow. Like that are going to it at a time. Yeah. Like, it's massive. Yeah. Like, it's massive, massive. And he's now 87, whatever. Um, and he's looking for a successor, right? He's well, he's not even really. He's mostly looking for a like <laughs> for like a sugar baby. Oh, <laughs> and then, like I will be that. <laughs> well, he's got a lot of requirements. Oh, let me tell you, maybe not. Maybe. Um, I don't know if I could hack it. He's mostly like that's <laughs> what I. This is my life's work, and right now I just really need. I want a oh, a partner, and. <laughs> That's it. And then he's got all these people around him that are like, I love the festival. I want to buy it from you or I want to be your successor. And he's like, yeah, I don't really think you got what it takes. I don't think you got what it takes. I got nine more years running this thing. So he's going to retire when he's 90. He wants to die when he's 95 is his main thing. One of the first things that you hear him say is, you know, that. I learned that in America, you can't just die whenever you want. The government wants to tell you when you die. So Sweden is the only country where you can go and die whenever you want. Yes. And I think it's like $20,000 or something and they'll kill you. And so that's what I'm going to do when I'm 95 is when I'm going to die. I respect that. And he's like that kind of guy. Wow. And he's like, man, and I (laughs) couldn't help watch it and just draw a connection to our current election. Oh, between man. the two, like he's somehow two, two, between two ancient somehow beings. like a like a a combo combo <laughs> like and I don't know like he's like the kind of like <laughs> decrepit and like this is where my I, this is where I shower and I shower in here because I don't need a shower curtain and I like it and then I sit and I watch TV here and this is my he doesn't really know what's going on but then he's like a ruthless businessman oh my same gosh. time. So, I don't know. <laughs> Highly recommend it. It's I've about watch it. there's three episodes. It's about an hour wa- hour each episode. I love it. Really good. <laughs> Very good. Did you have any other pop culture banter? Yada yada. Uh, I want to continue shouting out Chapel Roan. Chapel Roan, also Charlie XCX. I am absolutely yeah, good for Charlie into XCX. Into that record. Good for Charlie XCX job. coming back after. Yeah. It's weird because it was like, I feel like people were like, oh, last record was like a flop. Yeah. But it wasn't really. Yeah. And it didn't do as good as the one before. So I uh, think it felt like, right? I think it just felt like. I don't know. I feel like it's like a weird thing where people think that it did bad. Mm. I don't know. Yeah. This one, this one seems to like, it like kind of came and went. This one seems like it's having like. A moment. Yeah, like cultural relevance. Totally. Like in the moment instead of just being like a record that came out and people were like, it's good. Yeah. But didn't yeah. stick around. This one feels like it's it feels very honest. Around. You know, which I we talked about this in the last it's already episode. Been, the album cover's been memed to death and you already see like <laughs> uh um I saw like a there's a coffee shop in town that's doing like a brat latte and it's uh. like the like foam is like the somehow the exact color, like this very specific green color. <laughs> like how did you ma- how did you color match like your yeah. latte foam? That's pretty cool. I want that. I want I want that brat. You know you've made it when people are doing like unlicensed. Yes, merch. Like ri- like not rip offs, but like new dizzy gold. 
I want someone to rip us off. Standing outside this podcast studio selling t shirts like bootleg uh, t shirts. I would love it. Love it a bootleg. Be the best. Yes. Yeah, p- please boot. Let's start a pot like a pro bootleg <laughs> campaign. Yes. Oh, I'm pro bootleg. I'm pro bootleg because that's the only way you can get a bolt thrower shirt. And they're so yeah, hardcore they hate, about the shirts. They hate <laughs> that you can, that's how you can do it. I know, but that's the only way to get one. <laughs> Okay, run the commercial. That's Mike. That's Michael. And that's Keith. And if you're a fan of Dizzy Spell, then you must be a fan of the strange and unusual. And I myself am strange and unusual, and so is our podcast. So if you like a fierce horror podcast that slays the competition... Come check us out on the Horrified Podcast. You can find out more about us on weownthistown.net. Follow us on Instagram at the Horrified Podcast and stream us on all your favorite streaming services. Until then, just remember, we killed Liz. We killed the team dream. Deal, Deal with, with it. it. Interruption over. Now back to HP and Benicula. Uh, all right. So I bring you here today, HP. For a very serious business. I'm ready. I'm so, ready to learn. I think it's time to just tuck in, okay? okay. Sit back, because I'm going to take you on a journey. Let's say it's an investigation. And I want to give a little context here for how I got to this place where I am now. Maybe I've kind of mentioned this hinting in some past episodes. But essentially, my husband works at a botanical garden. He met a coworker who had some very interesting stories about her other place of employment at the Opry Mills Mall in Nashville, Tennessee. I live five minutes from this mall. I my very first jobs were in this mall. I worked at the Barnes and Noble Starbucks, and I worked at Banana Republic. Nice. Then I worked at the Journeys and the Journeys Kids. I worked at the at Opry Mills. All of them. At the Opry Mills Mall. I was an I was a mall rat. The for Barnes sure. and Noble doesn't exist anymore. Anyway, no. Right? When it flooded in 2010, they mm. never reopened. Yeah. Mm. So no Barnes and Noble in Nashville. Probably not. Yeah. There's no, there's straight up not. Yeah. There used to be the Vanderbilt one. Mm. Oh, down. right, right, right. So yeah, I heard this very interesting story and had a little bit of a personal investment in it just because I literally grew up. Um, I one time got in trouble trying to run across Briley Parkway with my skateboard, um, which was the stupidest thing I've probably ever Jeez. done in my life when I was probably like 15 years old because there's a skate park across the street um, as part of the land that we'll be talking about today. So strap in. First thing I want to do is I want to share with you this recording from a uh, very kind soul who was gracious enough to share their experience, their firsthand experience with us on air. So, well, on air, I guess we're not a radio show anymore. You know what I mean? On the record. It's in the air. <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> on the frequency. In the airwaves. <laughs> You're absolutely right about that, HP. <clears throat> so, I want to also preface this by saying my husband did this interview. Nice. So, yeah, we got a little... Uh, Shout out. Yeah, we got a little um, assist from the husband on this. So, I hope you enjoy. This is... Uh, a very fun little interview. So here we go. Hi, Unique. Hey. So I heard a story from a mutual friend that the Opry Mills Mall is haunted. Do you know anything about that? You work there, right? Um, it absolutely is. I worked in Opry Mills Mall for five years and I had multiple experiences there. What was your uh, first experience? My first experience was going to be a sign falling off the wall, but it went across the room instead of straight down. Um, And that happened in front of six employees who were nowhere near the sign, but we all saw it slide between us. So you actually saw it. It wasn't on the video or anything, right? Yeah, that one we actually saw. That's when I first was like had the first paranormal experience where I was like, hold on, what's happening here? Cool. Um, But we've also called it on camera um, with me working at two jobs in the mall. 
at another job, it was on camera where a board, a similar type of board had fell across as well. So I think the ghosts in Opera Mills like to destroy boards or just knock them off walls. Wow. Um, that is like one of the first experiences I had or two of those experiences with just boards falling off the wall. Um, my actual real scary experience was the footprints. Um, so I worked at a wax museum at Opry Mills Mall. And one night I was mopping um, the floor after work and I started to see footprints. And so I kind of second guessed myself. So I took the mop and re-mopped that area and the footprints were gone. So I continued to mop the rest of the floor. And when I came back to the room after finishing, there were footprints everywhere. They were big, they were small. It was actually their toe prints. So it wasn't like, shoes. yeah, it was like actual bare footprints. Like there were baby sizes, big sizes, medium sizes, and they had covered the room at this point. When I first saw them, they were only in like a small section of the room. Um, but after that, like, I, I don't know how I remopped the floor and they were everywhere after that. Like it got worse after remopping the floor. Did any, uh, didn't you have a coworker who saw that too? Um, I, I was so scared that I did go grab my other coworkers. Um, and it was about four to five of us at that time. And we all went back and we all noticed it. Um, and we all had to just take pictures because we were so scared. Um, I also have been chased in the mall by something. Like after hours, like I would be the last person to leave for the night. And I was walking through the mall and I heard footprints behind me. And I would look back and there was no one there. And then it just started seeming like it was getting closer, like it was running. And before you knew it, I, I was just running out of the mall. I was so terrified and scared. And I used to have something that hit my foot that felt like a hammer. And where was it? Was that the Mac Wax Museum? So this would happen when I was at my restaurant job, mm -hmm. um, like right in front of the kitchen station. It would just feel like something was in the middle of my foot, just hammering my foot extremely hard. I would like take my shoe off, try and figure out what's happening. I would move from that spot and not feel it. And it, it was just, it was just weird, just this weird feeling like something was really just like a hammer was banging my foot. So, so it actually felt pain. Yes, like I actually felt the pain, but like Ooh, that's awesome. I couldn't figure out what was happening. <laughs> um, and you said something before about um, like just bad energy at the mall too. You were there, weren't you there for some uh, experiences that were negative with people? Yes. Um, so I was at work one day and there was like a little altercation in the mall where someone was killed in the mall. Mm -hmm. um, Aubrey Mills Mall's land is also owned by Miss McGavick. Um, so Miss McGavick really intended that land to be like a donation. <laughs> And I, I do think she kind of haunts that area as well as the Grand Ole Opry area. Mm -hmm. You know, we've had like um, so many deaths just surrounding the Opry Mills Mall area, Grand Ole Opry and the Opryland Hotel. Um, there's also sightings of Miss McGavick, the lady in black and the Grand Ole Opry Hotel. Wow. Yeah. Oh, that's terrifying. Mm -hmm. So you, do you still work in that area? Um, I kind of, like, I, I, I'm still on their payroll, mm -hmm. but I haven't been there in a while. Um, I just knew, like, that was probably my main reason from wanting to move away from the mall because it, it was just a little terrifying at times. It felt unsafe. It was like a bad <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, 
And, and then I, I guess I'm also a person who kind of pick up on the energies, but I don't want to accept the fact that I pick up on the energy. It scares mm -hmm. me a little bit. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah, a little intuitive, and maybe it's like looks back at you, kind of mm -hmm. knows that you can see it. Yeah. Well, didn't you? Um, did you have any like managers or anything who uh, had stories? People who've been there for a long time. Did you meet anyone else who had, had stories like that? Yeah. Um, so my boss, so my boss of the wax museum, she, so we have cameras there. So during the middle of the night, she was always showing me things that were paranormal that were happening throughout the museum at night that was very unexplained. Mm -hmm. um, and then we've also like sat and talked about it um, at the restaurant. And I had a manager who was like, well, unique that's Miss McGavick. And as soon as she said that was Miss McGavick, a whole tray of cups just fell off the off the cabinet and smashed and, and we don't know how that happened. Oh wow. No one was around. It was like we just said her name, Miss McGavick, and the whole tray of cups just fell off the rack and onto the floor. It was so scary. And that's what really made me realize like what if this is Miss McGavick or the lady in black? So she's like potentially upset about the property being used for commercialism or just like not for... That's the rumor. Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, they also did own slaves back then. Mm. So the footprints to me kind of makes me feel like those were the slaves' footprints. Um, when I saw that with it being like different sizes and like, you know, if they're running around still trying to find their place or mm -hmm. you know that that that's what I thought the footprints were from um so probably probably a mix because it's the whole property mm -hmm. is the owners and the and the slaves yeah wow well thank you so much for sharing your story unique yeah no problem do you have anything you want to plug do you have any um like your social media or anything or do you want to stay more anonymous um you could follow me on my tiktok um at unique b <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Is that a unique and then just the letter B? Yep. Okay. Unique B. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Man. Pretty cool, right? Lots of experience. I like that um kind of uh idea that like certain people are predisposed to like having a lot of experiences like that mm. just like whether or not you're like an especially spiritual person yeah. or you're just like tapped into that or maybe it's like you're like predisposed to like have like having a lot of spiritual experiences like that or it like runs in your family i guess i'll just say mm -hmm. um i think that that is there that is true i believe that follow that for sure yeah. certain people that happens to more often than others. Yeah. I think it's about being a believer. Yeah. A little bit, right? Yeah, being like, open you know? to the experience, totally. And whether or not that's just like, oh, you realize these things are happenings versus you just like brushing it off or like, or completely ignoring it, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. That's the beginning. I heard this story. I was very intrigued by all of this because I felt like I had a bit of a vested interest here. So I did what a proper investigator would do, right? I hit the library. I hit the internet. Yes. I began to research and collect some more firsthand experiences. So I made a Reddit post that I sent to you and Michael. Yes. And this is what I said in the post. I said, hi, y'all. I recently heard an interesting story about some paranormal experiences several employees had at the Opry Mills Mall. Now I'm interested in further researching this, and I would love to hear any stories y'all might have heard over the years. Anything involving Two Rivers Mansion, Opry Mills, the Grand Ole Opry, Opryland Hotel, maybe even Opryland Park when it was still around. I am also curious to know more about the history of the land. From my small amount of research so far, it seems like the land was called McGavick Plantation back in the day, but there is also a McGavick plantation in Franklin, Tennessee. So I wasn't sure if I had my facts straight. Yeah, if that was right or not. Or for... Yeah. So, uh, of course, there were a couple of naysayers who downvoted quite severely saying things like, oh, you know, the paranormal's not real. And there were a couple of lighthearted answers as well. Uh, one Reddit user, Daysar, said, spooky, my family has only ever had misfortune happen when visiting Nashville. We used to live in Alabama, specifically Opry Mills. Both times we were rear-ended coming out of the Opry Mills parking lot. Spirits must have been restless. God. 
I hate when those spirits be backing up without using their backing out cam. <laughs> I thought that was a funny one, but it was lighthearted. So, so um, to jump right into one of the characters that kind of showed up in this story that Unique uh, told, I wanted to look into Mrs. McGavick. Yes. So uh, one of the Reddit posts from a user uh, called Daughter of Black Moon said, Mrs. McGavick is said to roam around Opryland Hotel. Find an old housekeeper and you will hear some tales. Someone else responded and said, she even makes the big chandelier swing near the escalators. Someone else uh, says, a- AWC4 on Reddit says, my dad worked at Opryland Theme Park for years, all the way until the day it closed. He swears up and down, they saw Mrs. McGavick walking around after closing, said she was in an old time black dress. He would tell us stories about it all of the time. And then recently a lady was in the movie theater at the mall a few months back and caught a ghost in the picture wearing a black dress. My dad had never felt so vindicated. Okay, so I found the ticket. TikTok. Let me see. Here is essentially the story goes. This this woman made a TikTok about it. She said this lady and her kids all went to the mall and they took a photo and this was in the back. That's a, a the what does clear, that look like? That's the clearest picture of a lady I've ever seen. It's a woman in black. Yeah. yeah. So here's another picture. <clears throat> Weird. Let me see the whole picture. That's all I got. I'm sorry. I couldn't okay. find the original photo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I was struggling to find it. I almost DM'd this person on TikTok to ask them for the photo. Why would you, if you were making a TikTok, why wouldn't you... I mean, they they might show it in the TikTok. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, uh, but I didn't screen cap it. So someone else says, oldest sea hag on Reddit says, oh my God, my parents also worked at the park and would tell ghost stories about Mrs. McGavick too. I remember there being one about a security guard doing his rounds after the park was closed and all guests were supposed to be cleared out, but he saw a woman standing in a gazebo wearing a long black dress. And as he approached, he realized that he could see through her. For the longest time, I was convinced this was something my parents made up. So I'm glad to know someone else also grew up hearing these stories. So this is all really interesting. Who is Miss? Yeah, it's so interesting. I had to know more about Mrs. McGavick, so I looked into her a bit. So Mrs. McGavick, or uh, I believe her full name was Mary Louise Bransford McGavick, uh, was said to be always her happiest when she was at the Two Rivers Mansion, which she was gifted as a wedding present when she married into the McGavick Mm, family. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? So Two Rivers Mansion is located on the National Register of Historic Places, and it lies nestled between the Stones and Cumberland and rivers, hence its name. The beautiful 1859 antebellum style mansion and the adjacent federal style brick home were once the centerpieces of Donaldson, Tennessee. The house was part of an 1100 acre plantation located on highly fertile rolling land and was built by David McGavick in 1859 for his bride, William Elizabeth Harding. So the McGavick family lived at this property until 1965 when Mary Louise Bransford McGavick died. Supposedly her death was an accident, a chandelier ear falling on her head is what I've heard. However, that's like so classic ghost. Right. right. Which there is like some precedence for this idea that someone who is killed in a way that is so surprising they don't realize they're dead might be a restless spirit that could haunt, right? Like that's yes. an idea that people have a lot. Some, However, somewhat side note, I'd love to look at a like uh some sort of chart of chandelier deaths as they've declined over the years. <laughs> like as the, like, I feel popularity. Like you always hear, like, that was super, it was super common for a long time. And when was the last time you heard, like, what's the most recent chandelier-related death? Yeah. Is what I'd couldn't like tell know. you. Couldn't tell you. That's why they've been phased out. <laughs> so here's the thing. I did some research. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure. There seemed like she was having health issues before she died from some things I read. I only saw like TikToks that were saying she got killed by that's a That's what I'm saying. It's so cliche. Right. Yeah. I'm not 100% sure that's true. No. So she did instruct the remainder of her estate to be sold to be used for the operation or expansion of the division of hermitology at uh, Vanderbilt Hospital and Medical School. Um, Two Rivers Mansion and its surrounding property are believed to be haunted by the ghosts of deceased Native Americans, Civil War soldiers, and McGavick family members. The Two Rivers Mansion events coordinator, Laura Carrillo, was 
quoted by WKRN as saying, it's like every older house. You do have people that remained after their passing. Mm -hmm. Our most famous is Mary Louise McGavick. I have seen her once in an apparition in the early 90s. She was in the pocket doors. She always appears in a white dress. She is fond of playing with the electricity in the water. She is. She likes to unscrew light bulbs and chandeliers, turn lights off and on, run the water. It's more like antics. Carrillo recalled a time she was so frightened she had to leave the mansion. We were setting up and I was down here. There was nobody here. My husband had left to grab us some food. All the doors were closed and all of a sudden the chandelier makes a particular noise with the prisms. It was like someone hit the chandelier and rattled the prisms. Truly, it got my attention and I'm like, okay, and I tried to ignore it. A few minutes later, it happened again, and it was louder. It was a little scary, and I decided to leave. Carrillo explained that you can also hear certain chilling sounds upstairs near the bedrooms. You'll hear a ball bouncing on the hardwood floor. You'll hear giggling. You'll see streaks flashing by and the smell of roses. You'll walk in and smell a rose garden. So Mary Louise Bransford McGavick definitely was really big into flowers, into gardening. Mm -hmm. Um, I read a bunch of stuff in the History of Donaldson, Tennessee book that I found in the library about how she, um, when she moved from the other place she lived to two rivers mansion she brought like all these plants with her so that's interesting also i went to a wedding at two rivers mansion when i was a teenager wow and i remember distinctly smelling roses isn't that weird yeah i just found this today and was like huh Uh, yeah weird that being like a distinct memory yeah of yours from that's like one of the only things i remember about i do remember it was a creepy building So there's also another house on this mansion property called the 1802 house. Carilla said, not many people can stay inside this house for very long. There's a feeling of heaviness and even nausea. Activities in the windows, seeing visions of images, like a person looking out of the windows. There's a lot of activity in this house. There's also photos of a figure in the window. So the Two Rivers Mansion website says this, plenty of haunted locations have their own lady in black and Two Rivers is genuinely no exception. This shadow figure has been seen gliding, yes, gliding across the floors of the mansion. Many believe the lady is not human at all and is a curse that was placed upon the land by Native Americans who used to reside in the area. Others claim the lady in black is a manifestation of the many deceased soldiers and their sorrow. Another claims that the lady is simply Mrs. McGavick, unaware that she is dead, wandering around the property that she loves so much. With further research, it's found that Two Rivers is built upon the land of a burial ground. At least 100 Native people were buried here, but the bones were not discovered until after construction. Instead of reburying the remains found in a respectful way, the property's previous owner used them in very blatant disrespect of Native culture that created a negative energy so strong that it seeps through time here. So we're going to get a little more into that about this disrespect you know how I love of... the when things seep through time and space. I love it. That's what I'm all about. I think that's the that's how you explain everything. It's fair. Yeah, that's that's a valid argument for sure. So there are tours on the Two Rivers property if you can buy that you can buy tickets to during Halloween time. They include a historical tour of the Two Rivers Mansion and the 1802 house. We gotta go. It sounds mm-hmm. great. So finally, I found this article that's also from our local local news station, WKRN. It's called Tale Behind Opryland's Most Famous and Restless Spirit. For more than two decades, Opryland USA was one of Nashville's most famous attractions. The theme park brought in guests from all corners of the country, but there are tales of a restless spirit frightening both guests and workers. According to Alan Searcy, author of Southern Ghost Stories Opryland, the old lady whose spirit lingered even after Opryland became Opry Mills is Mary Louise Bransford McGavick. She died in 1965, leaving her property to her church, which is where Opry Mills now sits. Mm -hmm. She left all the land next to the Cumberland River to her church, and she asked for it to be used as an orphanage or for a school, according to Cersei. And they were like, I got a better idea. However, her final wishes were not respected. Shortly thereafter, WSM bought it and built a theme park. So after the theme park got up and going in 1972, people started seeing an old lady walking around at night. 
According to legend, Mary McGavick's spirit haunted Opryland and her presence has also been felt at Opry Mills. She would chase people. They would see her in the gazebos. They would see her all over the rides. And it freaked people out. They closed the park back in 1990, 1999 and now they see her in the mall. Cersei adds, workers have noticed paranormal activity at the mall. People in the stores say things jump off the shelf. They come in the morning and find things on the floor. They hear noises all the time. I guess the ghosts from Opryland have followed over to Opry Mills. Well, she went, I want it to be a school. And they said, best I can do is theme park. <laughs> yeah, right. And then they doubled down and they went, I think that we could be more capitalist with this. Yeah. Let's go just mall, mall. Yeah. Just mall with it. <laughs> and a hotel. Uh, so you can learn more about the ghost of Mary McGavick in Alan Searcy's book, which is available on Amazon. Uh, but I did want to also get explore this other theory and factor that's kind of been coming up here, right? Okay. Restless native spirits. Yes. Now, fair warning. I will say to anyone who will listen that using this trope of burial grounds in horror is outdated and it's kind of lame. It's yeah. kind of it's kind of fucked up honestly to use. But this is factual. There were these graves found on this yeah, property. Yeah, it's not just like yes. oh it could like yeah. Yes. I am, I'm with you. Right? You know, like I just want to make that clear that like I don't love the whole like everything was built on a burial ground narrative. I don't think that's respectful to these cultures. So, all of us to say it, that it also like heavily implies that they're like would be vindictive and like Exactly. Insidious. Right. Yeah, I don't know. There's just there's a lot of gross implications there. So, uh I saw this Reddit post or Reddit reply, I should say, on my post from a, a user called Weekly Operation who said, a lot of people do not know this about the area, but Aubrey Mills was built on an ancient cultural site in Nashville. The spirits around there have been restless ever since its construction. Another person said, I'm surprised no one's mentioned the burial site. They found hundreds of stone box graves when building the Two Rivers Golf Course. There's a book called The History of Donaldson. God, I hate a golf course. <laughs> and it talks about this from the native skulls they found and put on post to the chief they found while building a McG McGavick Pike. A lot of disrespect has occurred in this area, and there's absolutely no recognition of the natives here before the McGavicks. So I dug online. I found this historical report for Two Rivers Mansion's master plan in the National Metro Planning Docs online. In it, there is a letter to the Tennessee Historical Society where a man named Putnam, Mr. Putnam, uh, described his venture to look at the stone box graves at Two Rivers. Specifically, he wrote about David H. McGavick's discovery of the burials. Mr. McGavick informed us that in making the road through this burying place, he plowed up 50 or 100 graves and that at least 20 skulls were placed by himself and servants as caps upon the stakes of the fence where they, rema what? Where they remained by action of the atmosphere until they crumbled and fell to pieces. No, don't, you can't like... Like egg them on. Yeah. And that among them all, there was but one grave wherein he thought the body entire could have been deposited at full lengthy. And this he regarded, regarded as the body of a chief by whose side was the small tomb in which was the skeleton of a woman. As these two graves seem to have been constructed with more care and contained about a bushel of mussel shells, the position of the bodies was easily discernible and deserved particular notice. A walnut tree was standing in the line of his road. The large roots were cut, excavations made around the tree and fell, turning up some of the stones of these graves. Mr. McGavick had the tree sawed in two, the top of the stump smoothed with a plane, and it showed the tree to be 120 years old. He then opened these graves with ease. The skeleton of the man was supine, that of the female the reverse. The head of the man was bent forward or resting upon the breastbone. That of the woman was turned back up on the shoulders with the face up. Upon the mouths of each were round ornaments of mussel shells, variously carved. In each of these are two holds evidently made for the suspending of these ornaments to the cartilage of the nose. So they were like nose rings, I think. Yeah. Putnam goes on to say, in October 1971, Metro Parks discovered stone box graves on what was to become the 10th and 11th fairways of the new True Rivers golf course. The site is located due west, about half a mile from the rear of the mansion. Carbon testing revealed the remains to be from about 1250 to 1300 AD. Yeah. Yeah. More, Man, more, this, is, this is mind blowing. I know. More graves were unearthed along the eighth fairway just west of the clubhouse. In essence, the highest elevations of the golf course were a Mississippian burial ground. 
So the last thing I want to share is a quote from the Two Rivers Mansion website because I thought it kind of summed up this whole thing nicely. They said, while the lands of Two Rivers have evolved, the home itself is frozen in time, holding all of the energies and the spirits of those who live there. The sounds of the McGavick family echo through the ornate halls of the mansion with laughing and disembodied conversations of souls gone by filling the air outside the home. V- visitors will always feel them, their energy so strong, so set in their ways that they are the history of this place. Interesting choice of disembodied on there a little ah, bit. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, yeah. It's I, like maybe not how I would say it. It's poetic for <laughs> sure. Um, so I just thought all of this was just so endlessly yeah, fascinating. That's crazy. I wanted to show you a couple more sources I brought with me today. So I got this book at the library. It's called Historic Two Rivers. Um, I wanted to show you, there's like some pictures in here. This is uh, David McGavick. This is David H. McGavick right here, who is the guy who did all that stuff with the bones. Yeah. That's him right Jeez. there. He yep. looks like the type. Yep. Um, this is a picture of Mary Louise Bransford it, at her debut when she became a debutante. Uh, and then this is a picture of Mrs. Spence McGavick, also known as Mary Louise Bransford, uh, much later on. And this is in 1963. Wow. Cool, right? So I just thought it was interesting to add this in here. But I also wanted to show you this. So... I saw that I, I read this on their website, on the Two Rivers Mansion website. Shout out to this website for really being real about a lot of the stuff that went mm. on there, you know? But I thought this was interesting. So on the building, I think this is on the 1802 house, there's these yeah. bricks. And here it says two other bricks show tiny footprints with the name Lena. So according to legend, these were the footprints of a child of one of the slaves making the bricks. Oh. Um. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. I just thought that was really interesting. And then here's a bunch of pictures of the stone box graves. I thought it was really interesting the way these were constructed. So I thought I'd also share this. When the remains were placed in the coffin, dirt was not used to cover the body. The body was dressed and laid on the top of a layer of stone, broken pottery, shells, and sometimes just the plain earth lining the bottom of the grave. Then, either a single slab or a group of smaller stones were placed over the entire grave, making a seal as they united with the side stones. Over a period of many years, possibly 30 or 40, dirt filtered between the cracks of the stones to completely fill the grave as we find them today. Notice here how thin the side stones are and only a single top stone is in place at the end but yeah like this is like a full body right there pretty pretty amazing stuff and yeah. just just basically in our backyard and i never knew about any of it they found child's graves they found that i thought this is really interesting they found um a, a few different little artifacts, like a ceremonial rubbing stone, some wet stones. But I thought this was cool. Where is it? Uh, probably the most outstanding artifact found was this very small frog effigy pot. <laughs> nice. Yeah. I don't know. If nothing else, I thought it would just be like... Yeah, that's crazy. ...worth honoring the memory of these people from 1250 BC or AD that had their entire, you know, resting places desecrated beyond belief. Really crazy stuff. Um, And then I had one more source I wanted to share today. So, like I said, I made a TikTok about this. Nashville Haunted Handbook. Nashville Haunted Handbook. I found this at the Nashville Library, but I'm absolutely going to buy this book. It's so good. Yeah, Uh, you can't bogart the copy at the (laughs) library. I know, right? Now that you're plugging it so hard. (laughs) So, this is by Jeff Morris, Donna Marsh, Garrett Merck. Pretty sure I've met Donna Marsh. I'm pretty sure I've met that lady before. So, that's fun. Um, so I wanted to just show you a few things in here. This is just broken up by location. Um, there is Clover Bottom Mansion, which is right by my house. I thought that was interesting. They talk about Two Rivers Mansion, which that pretty much gets into a lot of what we talked about today. They talk about Gaylord Opryland Resort and Convention Center, which is the Opryland Hotel I talked about. Um, and for each of these stories, they kind of give a little breakdown about the history of the place. And then they also tell a little bit of the ghost stories. So for this one... They say in the Opryland Hotel that a vast variety of ghostly encounters have been reported over the years, and most of the activity here seems to occur late at night during the third shift when most of the corridors are empty and most of the stores are closed. People will often experience uneasiness and will feel as though they're being followed as though no one's around. So 
people will hear voices and not be able to pinpoint the source. They'll feel uncomfortable and attribute to the presence of one of the many ghosts of the hotel. So there's one ghost who's seen often and they call her Mrs. McGavick. So we got a couple other stories in here. This is the Two Rivers Golf Course. Yeah. Which, we, as we just talked about, was where they found a lot of these uh, box graves. Haunted golf course. Yeah. This one, they say uh, that witnesses will hear footsteps behind them or sometimes breathing. But when they turn around to see who's trailing them, nothing is there. Nobody has a good game ever. This one's pretty dark. So strap in. Uh, this is Two Rivers Parkway. So this is basically, do you know what I'm talking about? This is like the street. I think... That like if I'm you so got off directions. if you got off at Two Rivers Parkway, you would take this road basically to McGavick Road. Yeah. So so this again they note was a Native American burial ground. A few years ago, a motorist who was driving around the corner of or the curve of Two Rivers Parkway saw something strange in the brush on the side of the road. Curious, the driver stepped out of his car to investigate, and to his absolute horror, he discovered the body of a young woman. The authorities were called in to investigate, and they discovered that the young woman had been brutally murdered and her body dumped alongside the river. Despite all efforts to locate him, the killer or killers have never been found. So a ghostly woman has been seen walking down Two Rivers Parkway. They, some who see this woman don't think that she's a ghost, and she looks like a real person who seems somewhat dazed and confused as she stumbles down the road. Others state that it looks like she's searching for something on the roadside. Those who stop to ask if she needs help are met with a startling occurrence. She will look up, make eye contact with them or her, and will vanish. Creepy Man. stuff, right? Um, is the prison from Green Mile in there? 100%. And yeah. you know I've been there, right? Yes. Yeah. It's super scary. I want to go back sometime. But yes, the Tennessee State Penitentiary is absolutely in here. So I have just one more I wanted to share. Um, but this is from the Grand Ole Opry House. So interestingly enough, they say that... Uh, no deaths have occurred within the building itself. The building has been overflowing with emotion, though, since its construction. Country music stars can finally confirm they have made it when they've walked onto this stage. The closest to death anyone's come within the building was when a stagehand fell victim to a heart attack and later died at the hospital. So despite the incredible amount of emotion that has played out on the stage, there are remarkably few ghost stories about the building. The ghost story that is repeated the most often suggests that the ghosts here never want the performing to end. They want the show to continue indefinitely. Stagehands and employees who are closing down the house after a night's performance will draw the curtains and kill the lights before leaving. This is a ritual they never forget to do. Despite having turned off the lights and closed the curtains, as the employees are leaving, they turn back to the stage and see the lights are on and the curtain has mysteriously opened. It must get annoying. Right. We just like, did this. Yeah. Come on. Um... What year is this book from? It's post the flood. So after 2010, let's see here. That's a really okay. good question. Yeah, I was curious too. So this is 2011. Is City House. Ooh, I don't think in so. In any respect. I don't I'm, do you know if like what the building was before That's or what anything? I'm, so it was a doctor's house. I want to say or maybe I'm mixing that up with where I lived before it was either a doctor or an architect or something um if we could find in the german town i wonder if we can find but so city place. houses uh, i think that they did what year were they? i think that you did that, like 15th or 20th anniversary even yeah i don't know how, i would have to do some research to figure out what the name of that building was but yeah that would be a really Confirmed good one to look haunted. into haunted Oh, confirmed. Yeah. <laughs> we still have to have Tandy on the show. For he sure. wants to do it. I'm, I'll hit him up. For sure. But yeah, we need to. I bet I wouldn't be surprised if there was some prior history of that building. We should we should do like a yeah. whole thing. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. So there it is, man. I just I just really that was awesome. Fell down well, a serious rabbit hole. Thank you. Well, well done. Shout out. Can we say Silas? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Shout out to shout Silas, out Silas for uh, Great interview. conducting that interview. Yeah. Big shout, shout out, out Unique. to Unique. Yeah. For taking the time. And you could hear nice little bird sounds in the back of their interview, which was very lovely. <laughs> um, this is like only like tangentially related. I like love going to the mall. 
<laughs> like I just do. I know. And I always have. <laughs> and I had like a kind of like epiphany a couple weeks ago about it because people are always like, I hate them all. Why mm-hmm. do you like? And I just like it. And I think that I realized that I like it because it is so terrible. Like it's I, just like constant entertainment. I like the <laughs> horribleness of it. I like being around it. Like I like kind of like going to like is the same way that you might like to go to like a shitty dive bar, you know, yeah. or like totally or some CD something. <laughs> like I like it for the same reason that I just like to go to the mall and just be around all these people doing horror like. Being rude. Maybe it's all the creepy ghost vibes you're picking maybe, up on. That may, uh, honestly, maybe. <laughs> like, I think that, that that might have something to do with it. <laughs> now, this is this whole conversation, everything you told me, mm-hmm. kind of validated it in that way. Because <laughs> I, I realized this, like, not but maybe two, three weeks ago. I was like, I like how bad this is. <laughs> That's what I like about it. I like how many are in it's horrible. So, I mean, that's better than, you know, being dragged there and having to be grumpy when your family wants to go to the mall. So I'm the that's one good. that is dragging the people. <laughs> I it, love it. That's the thing. <laughs> Went to the mall yesterday. You were in your happy place. Yes. I love it for Father's Day. It's beautiful. Yeah. All right. Cool. Great episode. Thank you. Hey. Pre- appreciate the research. Wow. Thank that you. That was awesome. I learned a lot. I hope the people did too. Um, it makes me want to deep dive different natural locations even further. Right? Well, so, we got the National Haunted Handbook. We got the handbook. I got to we'll, get one of those. Yeah. You got to return it to the library so the people can... Yeah. I also want to note, in the very back of this is a little appendix that has like all the names of all the places. And then it's like a little chart where you, oh, can, where you can like go and you like can you check went? off and go, I visited it. Check. I investigated it. Check. Wow. I saw a ghost. Check. Nice. Isn't that adorable? That's cute. I absolutely love this book. Thank you to the people who wrote it. Oh, uh, the Captain D's by my house is haunted, apparently, according to this book. Um, I think they all are. <laughs> that was probably my favorite discovery of all of my research, is that the Captain D's is haunted. Yeah. Because <laughs> that Captain D's has just been there for so long, and I don't think I've ever seen anyone go there and eat, but no, it's been there for so long. I've never so seen long. anybody go to any of them. <laughs> How do they exist? It's running on ghosts, apparently. Yeah. I don't know. Ah, well, <laughs> you've been listening to Dizzy Spell. We're coming out of We Own This Town Studios here in Nashville, Tennessee. Special thanks to Jay Childers for the sound bed music you hear throughout our episodes. Please check out his prolific work at jchilders.bandcamp.com. Thanks to our producer, Michael Eads, and our podcast network, We Own This Town, for hosting us. Thank you to Mac Burris for editing this episode and to Victoria Campo for our logo and design. Thank you to Silas Nunn for conducting our guest interview. And thank you to Unique for sharing your experience with us and all of the Dizzy Spellians out there. You can follow us on Instagram at Dizzy Spell Radio. Please leave us a review on your preferred streaming source. And thank you all for listening. Mm. Ah, gorgeous. And listening through to the end, post the thank yous. Yes. And thank you for giving us five magic beans on your preferred rating source. And liking and subscribing. (laughs) Smashing those various buttons. And most importantly, thank you for telling your friends if you love this show. Thank you for telling them you love that. And if you hated this show, thank you for telling your enemies that you love this show. Thank you for um, Venmoing me $20. (laughs) We got to pay to edit these episodes, y'all. <laughs> All right. All right. See you next week. Later, Dizzy Sellians. Bye. Bye. From 1980 to the early 90s, my father owned a video store in a small town in Kentucky. Join us the last Wednesday of every month as we take a journey back to that time and explore the films that were released during the home video boom of the 1980s. From holiday-themed horror... Christmas Eve is the scariest damn night of the year. ...to Star Wars ripoffs. There were countless trends during this period of cinema, as the advent of home video created an entirely new market for both producers of low and high budget cinema. 
Many of these films have been forgotten. Many of them are probably best left forgotten, but together we are going to discover the weirdest, campiest, strangest films you've probably never heard of inside my dad's video store. 